Welcome everyone. Uh, participants are trickling in, but I'm going to begin the presentation. Uh, I'm going to kickstart now. I'm Tandi Maheshwari. I'm the Associate Director of FCL Global here in Singapore, and I'm happy to, uh, to introduce today to you the third offering in our uh, Research Overture series. Uh, Research Overture is a series of talks that uh, we host at FCL, which focuses on new research topics that we are developing here. Uh, this is an opportunity for uh, the research teams in FCL to articulate their aspirations, their goals, their challenges and apprehensions to uh, this audience. And it's also an opportunity for this audience, you to participate in shaping uh, the research through dialogue. Uh, the format for this talk is um, 30 minutes of presentation and uh, 30 minutes of discussion. So we highly encourage uh, conversation, discussion, uh, and it's more casual format. But while the presentation is on, I request everyone to turn off or um, mute their microphones. So uh, there's no disturbance in the background. That said, uh, let me introduce the topic for today. This is Circular Future Cities. Today we have with us uh, Dr. Daniel Hall, who is the interim PI for uh, Circular Future Cities module in FCL, and uh, Dr. D. Peter Herthogs, who's the co I of the module. They will discuss today the uh, adoption of circular economy in construction using a systemic approach at the level of the whole city. Uh, we'll be recording this session for everyone as well. Um, and this would be available on our YouTube channel um, later. Uh, if you want to access uh, previous uh, uh, research overtures, I'm share I've shared um, I'm sharing with everyone in the chat here a link to our YouTube channel. Uh, so, without further ado, let me hand over to Peter and Daniel. Thank you, Tandy, for the very nice introduction. Um, hello from my side. I'm Daniel Hall, and uh, I'm Assistant Professor for Innovative and Industrial Construction, ETH Zurich, and I'm joined here by uh, Peter Hertogs, who's our co-investigator for the Circular Future Cities from the Singapore side. And we've had a very successful collaboration between, uh, so far between our two sides of Zurich and Singapore, which I'm very happy about. Um, today, we're going to talk about our project, Circular Future Cities, which we've uh, just begun, and we're excited to share our, our thinking and our early um, approaches, and we really look forward to your questions. So let's begin by talking about why do we care about circular future cities? You can go to the next slide, Peter. Um, <clears throat> if, you look at, yeah, if you look at uh, the total amount of waste generated in the built environment, from, uh, uh, mostly from uh, the deconstruction and demolition of buildings, it's estimated that we will have 2.2 billion tons globally of annual waste by 2025. Uh, to put that in perspective, I come from the United States originally. Um, the annual construction waste in the United States is twice as much as all residential waste combined. So the construction industry accounts for twice as much waste as all uh, waste that uh, you and I throw away in, uh, in our in landfill or, or in, our, in our trash. Um, and so if we look at the next slide, we can see that um, uh, there are opportunities to solve this. And there has been positioned this idea of moving towards a circular economy. And I assume many of you are familiar with the idea of a circular economy, but just in case not, um, we wanna think about how do we move from a linear economy where we take materials, we make something, and then we dispose and, and throw away the, uh, the remaining materials to a more circular uh, model where we emphasize recycling as the worst case scenario, but we also think about reusing, remanufacturing um, these materials in other uh, new combinations and in other ways in the built environment. So that's our goal that we're really trying to achieve for the circular economy. Um, but at the same time, um, as, as Peter is going to describe, uh, we think that ne this needs to go much, uh, much further and much deeper. So Peter, I turn it over to you. Yes, thanks, Daniel. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Peter. Um, with Circular Future Cities, we want to uh, shift the perspective a, a little bit because when we're talking about circular economy uh, in construction, we're often as building level researchers talking about the building level, while of course these economies that we're talking about are systems that exist at the city scale and at even larger scales. 
And so inherently, uh, circular economies in construction depend on systems beyond the buildings and uh, inputs and outputs uh, into it from the system to the building and vice versa. Now, what we need and what we advocate for is a shift in focus um, and the question, how do we support circular economies in construction at the scale of the city, city and the settlement system? So the, the larger system of settled uh, around uh, cities. And so in a way, it's a, a shift away um, to focus more on what is outside of the building rather than the building itself. And that of course implies a need to understand and support the material flows. So the inputs and outputs between buildings and this uh, urban, urban system, this uh, circular economy system in general. But this of course extends to more than just the context of a building. Um, it also implies the need to study the systemic properties of circular economies in construction at a much larger scale looking at cities and the resources in their surroundings and understanding and supporting the emergence of sustainable material flows in settlement systems. So circular future cities as a module of FCL Global uh, studies key enabling technologies that focus on this more si urban systemic perspective. And our project uh, brings together six themes or work packages that uh, focus on key technologies at a more systemic level and their interdependencies. And so these technologies support and enable circular economy and construction systematically beyond uh, the building level. Of course, you know, we have a number of topics and things we study. So that's not an exhaustive list of themes and topics. There's other things, but these we find particularly interesting and particularly necessary and crucial. We are a team of transdisciplinary uh, researchers uh, because we have quite a number of uh, research topics um, we bring together quite a good team of uh, investigators here and our team of researchers is also growing um, ever greater as we progress now in terms of uh, a, a main message to that I would want to uh, give to you as a kind of uh, thread through the presentation is that this urban systemic perspective uh, explains a lot of our scope and focus. And there's three kind of perspectives that we can think of. There's the systemic circularity perspective. So looking at the system itself in a way of how do flows and economies of materials happen in space and time. There's the interface of input and output. How does, does this econ economic system or these flows, how do they go into the building? How do they leave the building again? And then thirdly, there's the perspective of information management. Um, because of course, it's in any circular economy, information management is cru crucial because it's only by knowing what these materials are that are flowing in an economy that you can actually quantify the flows, keep track of it. And particularly in construction, this is crucial because you're, we're dealing with uh, objects that we produce that have to last for several generations, which means that the information um, you keep and store also needs to last in a sustainable way for several generations. So the bulk of our presentation will introduce the uh, research themes of our project. Um, and that will that is split along these three perspectives. In the second part, we want to start conversations with you. Um, we have some concluding notes and then we can start the Q&A and discussion. That's about the second half of this uh, presentation. I now hand over to Daniel to start with uh, the body of our presentation. Thanks, Peter. So our first uh, urban systemic perspective is one of systemic circularity. So again, beyond just the building scale, but this is about mapping and analyzing the flows and materials across space and across time. Um, and we have two uh, uh, research themes within this. And the first one is about the system analysis and diagnosis. Um, so the goal here is that we want to identify the environmental hotspots with regards to material type and simultaneously be able to estimate when and where resources are needed. 
um, so that these can be released from the building stock. Um, what we're doing is we're trying to set the context here of the, the whole um, entire module and uh, point to the uh, potentials of large scale um, circular solutions. Um, in other words, we, we are trying to better understand the current material flows and the possible renewable uh, material potentials. Um, so in order to do that, uh, we, we think about the input and the connection with the other themes. So this includes um, information about the, the mapping of the new materials and the uh, more highly resolved information about new buildings, which we'll come to later in the presentation. Um, and in this context of, of the whole module, what we're, what we're doing is we are um, uh, creating an output, which is a spatio-temporal mapping of, in this case, uh, the Swiss building stock and all the material resources that are found within it. Um, and this will be a, a basis for the environmental assessments of the, of the scenarios and the synthesis that comes later. So this is our approach to uh, theme one. And we have a little bit more details. We talk about our approach um, next is really it's a, it's a refinement and combination of multiple detailed bottom-up models. Um, to, to explain more, more detailed, um, we'll look at the uh, and assess the environmental consequences of current and future material stocks and uses and flows um, for, for in this case for Switzerland. And in order to achieve that, we're gonna build upon, combine, uh, update and refine the existing um, highly developed and highly detailed bottom-up models on building energy, material use and household consumption. Um, by combining these dy dynamic uh, material flow analysis with a life cycle assessment, we think we can exclude uh, an explicit model of the supply chains, uh, for example, for the hinterlands of the settlements and assess the environmental impacts of these uh, stocks and flows. Um, and now I'll turn it back to, to Peter to talk about the second Thanks. theme within our first uh, perspective. So theme uh, one, um, for reference, is the is led by Professor Stephanie Helwig. Uh, theme 5.2 is led by Professor Rudy Stuffs and uh, Dr. Aurel van Richthofen. And there they look at mapping material stocks for building types uh, using machine learning. And they'll be developing a spatial temporal mapping and analysis tool um, for building material stocks based on building types. Um, particularly, they'll be looking uh, at uh, HDB typologies in Singapore. HDB is the uh, public housing here and uh, represents uh, the lion's share of residential uh, housing and a big uh, part of the built environment. Um, they will build and calibrate uh, machine learning classification models to infer material quantities from building type age and geometry. And with these models, the, the, the resulting values can then be mapped and analyzed to predict uh, stocks in space and time. Um, so to have a, a geospatial tool in order to explore this uh, four-dimensional data. Um, in uh, in space, and of course, this will integrate findings from the life cycle assessment, systems analysis, and diagnosis that um, Daniel just discussed, and also um, will integrate um, detailed material recovery yield uh, models that we will discuss later. And so, the uh, idea is to create. A tool here, you see an example, a prototype from the, the last uh, FCL. Um, but it, it's a tool where you can, uh, in, in, in space, consult, see where the stocks are, uh, what the information is, when particular uh, materials will be made available. Um, but rather than this kind of, let's say, data consultation tool, uh, it'll be a smarter version of this uh, with a better data-driven approaches and integrating some of the methods we'll be developing in the module. Good. That leads us to our second uh, urban systemic perspective. So if you remember, our, our first was about systemic circularity. Our second is about the input and the output interfaces so that we can uh, understand how to improve the resource use and recovery between building and city. And I start uh, with uh, theme two of our, of our module, which is led by Guillaume Hubert. And the goal here is, is really to focus on the design of improved materials, um, whether that would be uh, uh, materials 
um, with less consumption of primary resources um, or that uh, closed material cycles could think about using better forms of concrete that don't have um, um, as high of a CO2 impact, but also what are the materials that can uh, be reused and, and remanufactured more easily. Um, and then the input to this theme is to uh, is from the previous theme, the spatiotemporal mapping. Um, and then from this, we will be having output, which includes the definition and information about the new materials and mapping um, the resources for the, for the new materials. Here you have an example on the next slide of a flow diagram where they're uh, giving an example of the approach that can be used. So we want to identify uh, where are the non-recycled um, material flow and where is the, the linear flow of, of materials occurring. So you can see between, you know, uh, on the diagram between built environment and excavation, primary materials and building materials. Um, and by doing this, we can create a comprehensive assessment and optimize the new materials in terms of their environmental and of course also economic impacts, Econom economy being important for circular economy because we say that these assets have a economic future value. And then these new materials also require the redesign of the building. So we wanna optimize for just dis, uh, disassembly, what's called design for disassembly, uh, recyclability or, or extended life cycle times that, that match the functional life cycle we intend. Um, and finally, then we can create this inventory of regionally available and hopefully renewable resources uh, and set these up. Um, so this will be the approach that we're gonna use in theme two. So, uh... Team two talks about the interface from an input, the flow of materials going in and how to make that more sustainable. Uh, theme 5.1 focuses on the output and the modeling the material recovery yields that you get out of a building. What kind of materials do you get back? Um, and particularly, um, we will model this using configurational properties and we call this model the circular economy potential model. What do we mean with uh, configurational properties? And by we, I mean myself and Professor Rudy Stoofs. Um, that is how uh, building components and materials uh, and buildings themselves are attached. How is everything assembled? Because a building is more than um, a collection of materials by weight or, or tonnage. Actually, how everything is connected together uh, greatly determines how much of it you can recover and for what you can still use it. Um, and so our aim is to model uh, the yield of resources out of buildings in order to better understand how their design and affects these recovery rates. So, okay. Um, so of course, material configuration affects recovery in many ways. Uh, this assembly uh, affects how, how easy it is to get materials back. It also, um, the way in which something is connected also determines whether you damage components when you take them out or not. And that again determines in what capacity can, they can be reused. There's aspects such as contamination, uh, you know, putting a sustainable next to a non-sustainable material or a toxic next to a non-toxic. Um, it of course affects service life risks and things like that. And so there's many types of goals that are affected by configuration and that in together affect the uh, recovery yield of materials. This modeling we will do for new construction and in a building information modeling environment because it's quite detailed. And so we start from the kind of uh, gold standard BIM and seeing what, how, what's the feasibility of modeling things in such detail with all these configurations because it requires quite a bit of data. And the reason why we're exploring this is because it's an exploration of a paradigm shift. Because when it comes to circular economy, there's what is often mentioned is urban mining as a paradigm, but that is in a sense a, a paradigm that doesn't match circular economy that well because it's a paradigm of uncertain ones of discovery of precious material. There is copper somewhere hidden in the building. But if we are actually designing uh, for a circular economy in construction and we know the materials we're putting into and we know uh, what we would be getting out of it. A better way of describing this paradigm would be ha urban harvesting, where we would be going to a paradigm of certain planable and cyclical recovery of materials. And so it becomes more easy to plan, oh, well, when will I be getting back this concrete or this steel or other materials or particular components? 
and of course different goals affect this differently because if you make it easy to disassemble certain components in your building that's good you can get your you know your your, your recovery yield becomes higher but it also makes it easier to maintain that building and to adapt that building so it might be that you use the building for longer and that's good from a sustainability point of view yeah I've used the building for longer but if we are thinking of you know relying on the economy of getting materials back it's good to know when things will come back and depending on how we design it how does that affect when we get our materials back these kinds of loops and interactions between the multiple goals the different levels of components versus materials versus uh, buildings so the circular economy potential model will combine a plurality of existing and new metrics evaluating goals and indicators for recovery and reuse um, in order to map out these different goals how they interact so that you can see oh well this this design might be doing better in this kind of quality versus that kind of quality. Here on the slide on the left, you see uh, an example of a Saga analysis, which is a method to quantify a floor plan adaptability and generality that determines how reusable a building is. On the right, you see uh, some explorations of uh, metrics to quantify the disassembly potential of wall types that we've been working on uh, with some ETH master students. Good. So just as a recap, our perspective number one was on systemic circularity. Our perspective number two, which we just presented, was on the input-output interface. And now our third urban systemic perspective is in, is in regards to information management. Um, and as Peter rightly pointed out at the beginning, we need to think about information management uh, because this is the basis on which we can do things like think about harvesting versus mining. Um, when we have an understanding of what the what the uh, where the data is and, and what how that corresponds to real built assets, um, and so we need to support the flow, quality, and longevity of material data. You could actually go back. I'm, I was going to stay on this one for a little bit. Uh, no problem. Um, uh, you can see here you have the you know interconnected data at the building level, and then you also have uh, you know this network of data that that goes up to the to the city level. And um, for me. Uh, there are some unique challenges when we think about information management in the built environment. If you compare it to, let's say, a, a mobile phone, which has a lifespan of four years, um, your typical building is going to have a lifespan of 50, 75, 100 or longer years. Um, and it might change, the asset might change uh, hands with multiple different owners and parties. So how do we think about an information management system that, that lasts um, across this type of specific asset? You could go now to the next one. Thanks, Peter. <laughs> um, and so uh, there's there's already a perspective for circular economy on how to, to think about carrying assets. And that's the idea of a material passport as the carrier of circular information. I um, mean, this is uh, the, the goal of theme three, which is led by myself. And if you show the next uh, image, you have two um, you have two perspectives which we're starting from, which we find to be very helpful, but we think can also be extended. So on the left, you see the idea of a material passport. It's basically a data carrier that follows a product um, and it includes all the information about uh, the chemicals, the factory, um, the, the shipping, the instructions for assembly and disassembly, the sources of energy and, and CO2 emissions that are associated. And these can all be tied to a, to a passport that follows a, an asset. Um, and then at the same time, we also have on the right, uh, the current perspective, which is you can have all of these material passports and then they can be uh, contained in a, in a central database. And um, we think these are good starting points, but then we also wanna question maybe how can these be extended or moved forward? And I'll describe those in, in these next two themes. Um, so first on the left, as we think about how to improve the idea of material passports, I could go to the next slide. Um, one thing we've already started on is, is thinking about creating a, and moving towards a material passport ontology. Um, and essentially what we're, what we're trying to do here is that using ontology-based data integration to use ontologies and effectively combine data and information flows from multiple sources across the different actors and stakeholders that exist um, in, the, in the construction life cycle. On the right, you can see the, the relationship that we're starting to think about of between actors, uh, functional classes, data properties, and life cycle phases. Um, and we wrote a conference paper recently on uh, our proposed ontology. And this can be useful for documentation, identification, and, and maintenance of the, of the assets at the specific product level, but also then at the building level, and ultimately, uh, possibly then uh, also at the city level, although that would take quite some work. 
Um, so it's a very bottom-up approach at uh, uh, looking at the actual assets. Um, and, and we're moving forward towards refinement and validation um, and a case study with this, with this proposed ontology. Um, now, ontology should not exist alone. Um, we are building on top of other ones. So on the next slide, uh, we're working with ontologies such as the building topology ontology, uh, which, which links uh, the relationship between site and building story and elements, interfaces and zones, and also uh, work by Salter on agent and activity and reference so that we can, um, uh, there's a lot of work in construction informatics around ontologies, and we wanna make this contribution around the material passport um, and, and an ontology for that. Go to the next slide. All right, and this leads to theme four, which is led by um, Heiko Eight, who um, uh, we're looking at the idea of then okay, we have a material passport which contains the relevant information, but what do we do with this passport and how do we solve the issues of longevity of this data that needs to happen? And so then we have moved towards this idea of distributed circular data that can be um, uh, distributed computationally and, and carried forward um, in the long term. Our original perspective, and you can kind of start cycling through a little bit, was to, to think about, okay, if you have a specific uh, information model, a building information model, and you have a material passport for a specific panel on the facade here, um, which carries all the information about the chemical composition and all the life cycle data. We need to keep this data for hundred years. So then um, we would use our material passport ontology to help generate and create the, the, um, the information here. Um, and then if you go forward, the, the, uh, we we've now are thinking about how do we then um, put this on the blockchain and create an immutable record. So the goal is to go towards a, a, a blockchain based um, uh, record of assets. And this, this blockchain-based record would be uh, therefore immutable through distributed ledger technology. I don't want to get into details here, but happy to discuss any questions. Um, and this is still the approach we're taking, although um, we have some, some more further developments. On the next slide, we started to think about also what would the actors and transactions look like in such a proposed blockchain network? So how do we financially incentivize the need for this data? Because right now the data also exists, but the problem is that we have not found a way to structure it or to make it valuable to, to different uh, uh, stakeholders. Um, so here, uh, I won't go into too much details, but we're looking at the interaction between circular product data, which may have value, and circular product ownership, which may have value. For example, if you have the steel, uh, the rights to all of the, the steel rebar that exists in a building, can you um, sell those rights to a future recycling or, or um, reuse company? And so we've started to map out the relationship between a data consumer, data provider, the community um, of trusted transaction partners, a building owner, and a product buyer. Um, so this is a paper we're working on now. Um, and then furthermore, we've, we've thought more about this, and uh, many of you are probably aware that blockchain has quite a bad environmental footprint. And we've questioned a little bit, is, there, is, is blockchain necessarily the only solution or the right way to do this? And so we've started to think about uh, perhaps you know, not going with necessarily strictly a blockchain based, but uh, maybe a distributed database to create the distributed data marketplace. And of course, we're very early in our thinking here. There's a lot to do, um, but it's important to note that there is the, the data organization, which is around a P2P network in the middle. Um, and examples would be such as the interpl interplanetary file system or uh, the big chain um, database. Um, and so this is a, a way of organizing the data so it's not stored on a central server, um, such as Modaster today, um, but then is available to all who, who would have the rights to access it. Um, and then second is what's the role of the broker? So who is the, the broker and how do they deal with this distributed data marketplace as well? So we've started to give some thinking to that. Um, and uh, is, are there alternatives outside of blockchain for circular product data? Um, yeah, so I think that wraps up uh, theme four, which is led by Heiko. And uh, finally, I'll, I'll, I'll end with this. So we have our three themes, and now um, our last theme, uh, our last perspective is one of synthesis and bringing together the systems of stakeholders to establish a mutual learning network. And really, this is last, but it's also a core part of what we're trying to do, but it, it only makes sense to present kind of the different research, but then talk about now how the, the synthesis must occur. Um, and if you go to the next slide, um, this is how we prospect, uh, our perspective is that the systems level transition must consider the institutionalized governance structures that exist in cities. Um, every city has unique uh, building codes, 
regulations, labor relationships that need to be taken into consideration if we're going to think about what uh, change towards more circular cities looks like. They also have very distinct norms. Um, sometimes they're not even uh, codified or, or regulated, but they're just norms around what it looks like for material waste and end of life of buildings, just the way things are done. Um, and finally, cities have different cultural acceptances around uh, privacy and data sharing. So these all need to be taken into consideration in our, in our synthesis. Um, and so theme six is about identifying and informing the structures that do need transformation, because we, while we want to be aware of these things, we also don't accept the status quo. Um, and so this requires collaboration and engagement between governments, industry, and civil society, and we, we're, we're setting this up. Um, and really, the, the goal here is to co-create knowledge for new institutional structures that can enable um, more circular future cities. So um, yeah, I think this is uh, our last slide, if I remember correctly. Um, so just in summary, we've introduced uh, Circular Future Cities, the, the module and its research themes. Um, each theme is a key enabling technology. It focuses on, um, yeah, it focuses on the three urban systemic perspectives. So the first one, which we described was the systemic circularity perspective. It's about the flows uh, and economies in space and time. And here we're looking at the environmental hotspots we discussed in, in theme one, and also uh, taking from theme five and thinking about the circular economy potential. The second is about the input and output interface perspective about the material flows between buildings and the circular economy. And we do this in uh, theme two, where we look at the upstream design of materials and material flow, and in theme five, where we understand then the implications to the building design. And third, we have the information management perspective. So how do the information flows and, and uh, quant quantities and qualities are, are managed system systemically? And here we have the digital information ecosystem with the material passports and the idea of information management around blockchain-based digital building assets. Um, so with all of that, uh, I thank you very much for your attention. I see there are some questions in the chat already. And uh, I, I believe also we will invite some members of the the um, group to, to take the stage or to answer questions as well uh, beyond just Peter and I, but thank you for your attention and we look forward to your questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter and uh, Daniel. This was a lot of information um, and I think you covered the whole breadth of the project and I appreciate that you introduced the team members because I think each of these themes could in itself be a whole seminar uh, and we know who to get in touch with if we want to get more information on specific topics. Um, I see there are already questions in the chat. So maybe I can start pulling out people from the audience already. Uh, Liza raised a question about uh, looking at building beyond building city interface and looking at uh, land use and industry interface. Maybe Liza, you want to articulate your question. You can unmute yourself. Thank you very much. Um... Yeah, I, I guess when I asked that question, I had the perception that circularity is, is more dynamic and um, uh, more in, in real time with all the flows through the city than just uh, demolished buildings, which is the temporality of that is quite different. However, I think if we're looking at the, the, the whole circular cities, then uh, recognizing the opportunity within a particular building and the city and the flows between that building and the city, it can very easily be extended to look at where else similar opportunities exist that may be able to be harvested. I, I like that the distinction between mining and harvesting. The harvesting opportunity, the moment you recognize it in one, um, the opportunity to, to look at where else similar harvesting opportunities right now may exist uh, becomes very open much, much more opened up if you've looked at your whole urban context from uh, um, the, the footprint, the land use, industry, because similar flows may, may potentially be in other buildings across similar industries, as well as for, for input and output. Peter or Daniel, would you like to respond to uh, Nigel's comment? Take that one, Peter. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll start by saying that uh, it, it would be, uh, oh, actually, I see that uh, Andy's here. Andy, maybe do you want to give a perspective here? Because I think you are more uh, qualified than I. If, if you're able to join, I think he was maybe traveling. So, um, yeah, hi. 
<clears throat> can you hear me? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Good. Well, <laughs> yeah, it's difficult um, to 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 give a kind of a um, an answer that may might be satisfactory. But um, I guess I mean it's true. I mean there are different temporal scales, and um, but at some point we we also have to draw some system boundaries and uh, to focus on a on a certain time scale and uh, uh, certain uh, materials and um, yeah I don't know I mean um, it it's it is just even though in my opinion circular economy should kind of comprise kind of everything and must be as holistic as possible. It's just not possible for a research project. I know this is not a satisfying answer, but um, we, we 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 cannot kind of take every every everything into account, and uh, yeah, I have to kind of focus on on a specific part, which is in this case kind of the, the buildings and and the buildings and city interface. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe you, you want to add something, Daniel or Peter. I, I was that was going to be my same answer, so I'm glad we're aligned. Is that it's of course it's incredibly important, but we just uh, we made a strategic decision to focus on the buildings, and of course there's a temporal dimension where a more robust integration with other resources would be key. But we just uh, uh, we have to leave that to someone else, um, just from our from our uh, scope of work. And also, of course, it doesn't mean our our findings aren't at least in part transferable to things that are in buildings, as you already mentioned in your question. Uh, I encourage everyone to post their questions in the chat box uh, or yeah, just uh, let me know if you have uh, any specific concerns. But while you're thinking of the questions, I was just, uh, uh, I, I want to look at uh, point, the two case studies that you're looking at, Switzerland and Singapore uh, that you pointed out and then they, how, how different they are in terms of when you're looking at building materials and uh, the weathering uh, of these materials, but also in the systemic sense, the ownerships of these materials and how this is organized. And I was wondering what the rationale is and how, how you're going to, how each learns from the other. And uh, then the issue of scalability of your findings from each of these unique cases. Um, maybe let me, start by highlighting a couple of specific points for from the Singapore side. Um, for example, here, because you, you large parts of the of the buildings are under leasehold. Uh, and so they, they literally have a limited lease of life. And you know, they might only be on, on leasehold for 99 years. That gives you a real opportunity to start planning with resources because of course, you know when the, the materials are coming back in. Um, so so it, that, is, that is something that is coming initially from, from Belgium where I was working before. That is a very different kind of perspective. Also um, in terms of how uh, construction is dealt with, because here it's, it's very much done by companies and there's no real DIY uh, aspect to construction, which is of course a very big, um, in, in, in Europe, and I think in most of the world, that also kind of picks up on a question I saw fly by from Stephen, uh, partially, because I didn't get to read all, the whole question. So let's pick that up later. Um, but the the thing is that, yeah, it, it, is a, it is a different kind of approach as well in terms of, um, let's say many of the examples uh, from, from Europe are very uh, towards the kind of, um, User, user perspective or being able to incrementally build your own house and things like that, that doesn't really exist here. Uh, here it's all uh, you know, built in, in a big tower uh, and somebody builds it and somebody does the contracting work for you as well. Um, so there's different perspectives like that, but that doesn't mean um, it's, it's a shift. It's interesting that those differences are there. It makes you question certain assumptions that you have. So I think that's enriching in terms of having two settings. You can't just assume certain things, they might not work in the other one and vice versa. And, and I think that's the enriching part of uh, FCL Global. Um, but yeah, that's just two examples from Singapore. So the question that you refer to that flew by, Stephen, would you like to unmute yourself and uh... Yeah, I mean, in a way, Peter, you, you've answered in a way the flip side of my question. Um, so I, I was listening um, 
just with great enthusiasm. I, I, it sounds very, very exciting project. And I'm wondering to what extent um, it's enabled in a way by the, the sort of information technology in particular. So one way to look at it is that, of course, people have always been recycling cities and there are certain kind of agents who are always historically privileged, like the gleaner or the rag and bone man. And in a way, they had an understanding about the city because they would be paying attention to how the city, uh, how individual buildings would deteriorate and when they're available to be gleaned and whether they could profit from those crumbling, crumbling buildings in a way. So they had a special kind of knowledge about the city. Um, but by, I'm just going to pause. A minute. So, um, but in a way, by, by having this kind of access to information, especially the way you're, you're proposing to integrate information into the kind of fabric of the, of the city, that sounds in a way you're going to be turbo boosting the logic of the rag and bone man, I suppose. Um, could you maybe reflect a bit more on this information dimension of it and, and whether it's just as radical as I'm imagining or, or in fact, is the radicality across the whole project? Daniel, do you want to answer? I can also answer. I think we'll both give radical answers. But... <laughs> Why don't you go first, Peter? Then I give my... Yeah. It's, it's, it is exactly... Uh, you could imagine, it's a good, a good analogy, this kind of turbocharged uh, rag and bone man in the sense that, um, you know, you, you have somebody specialized in a certain material or something like that. And once you can create digital assets of certain material types, whether it's a, the whole component or, or it's just one particular material or some kind of type of nice floor tile or something. It could be very specific because you have the information you can really mm -hmm. diversify. And it can also diversify over time. You could say, you know, you could say spatially or depending on the type of building, but you could also say, well, I'm gonna specialize in future rights for this type of nice tile or something like that. Uh, so in that sense, there's a lot of uh, perspectives. And, and in, the, in the project, when we thought about this, we also realized, well, once, you know, th this idea is there and that, that you need this information management it needs to be done digitally. It needs to be, uh, it needs to be stored for a long time. You need this technology. But once that exists, there'll be all kinds of offshoots in terms of what you can do with it. All of a sudden information and the quality of information will be able to be marketed. Because currently, you know, there's lots of things being built, lots of information being gathered, but it's only a small subset that gets stored and then it's stored in some company, that company goes bankrupt, the, all the information is gone. But once you can start thinking about, well, actually that information might be interesting in 50 years it starts getting value and then you have an incentive uh, to you know, increase the quality and maybe you can hire people specifically tasked to you know, having a certain quality standard of your data as a contractor, for example, so that you, know, you can have a, 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 a revenue stream on the side selling future rights on, on, on your data or something like this. So there's all kinds of things that could happen that, and I'm sure people will think of things that we can't even imagine. Uh, yeah, I completely agree. And I think um, I'll even, yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll just state it in my terms, um, um, how I see it is that we're, we are augmenting or kind of uh, propping up the, at a fundamental level, this uh, starting point, this, this rag and bone man, or this kind of uh, harvest, like, you know, kind of looking for what's there, but also by setting up such an information management system, we also are developing the incentives for people to do much, much more. And I think this is what Peter is getting at. Um, right now, you kind of have ideas of product as a service or, or circular design of new buildings, yet we don't really have a good way to track or, or ensure that those goods are kind of entering into product as a service life cycles um, throughout the whole uh, perspective because of our very, very long life cycles. Um, so we have a, a paper that's gonna be coming out very soon about product as a life cycle using uh, blockchain and digital twins and how that enables more servitization models. So, um, and uh, you can imagine that uh, this, this goes very quickly into the idea that, you know, you're renting um, pieces of the facade for a 25 year life cycle. 
Um, and that company uh, will will give it back. Now, there's questions around business models. It gets into you know a lot of different questions that we want to ask and we want to understand. But it very quickly goes that way. And then I think it starts to if you start to create the incentive systems, you start creating the opportunities for design for better design. And then we're no longer in the kind of pulling out raw materials, but we've really thoughtfully redesigned our products because we know that they have a value and we can track them in the, in, and we can reclaim or, or, or take them. So Maybe as a, as a... I was just going to say, I, I would just flag for the for future discussion is the DIY dimensions and what you were referring to, Daniel, about the, the productive dimensions downstream. I, I think that's that's very exciting. And I think every architect should be paying close attention to this. This is a very, very interesting area. <coughs> I see a question from Sultan for uh, Daniel. Sultan, would you unmute yourself and? Sure. Um, that's that. That was a really great presentation, and particularly last uh, two uh, teams are pretty much aligned uh, with my own research at Tadelt. That's why I was so curious. How um, actually? I have actually two questions. The first one is as I posted. Uh, how do you define uh, data or information requirements of all actors like architects, uh, municipality, users even, uh, or construction companies uh, across the life cycle stages in cities for, for uh, as you mentioned, like the, for the circular flows of materials? And my second question is about um, um, how do you define resource? Because um, you you actually uh, focus yeah you you actually mentioned that uh, you follow a systematic approach but what I see is like you're focusing simply on materials uh, but when you're talking about cities you have energy land um, food or uh, labor and you know this kind of resources as well so um, that part is missing and that they make the problem even more complex. Uh, what is your um, uh, idea or opinion on this? Why only materials, but uh, not other um, resources in cities? So, Peter, maybe I could take the first easy one, and I give you the second hard one. So, okay, that's good. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so uh, the the question of how do we understand who are the actors in in tracing the the materials and, and doing this? This is exactly what we're doing right now. Um, and in fact, um, one problem is that we have very, very poor understanding of supply chain in construction, much poorer than any other industry. Um, and so uh, as we develop our material passport ontology, we think about this circular data flow, we need to find good data to also validate it. Um, and so I wanted to call on Firhi Watts, who's the PhD researcher. She's actually working with a company in Sweden who, who um, is uh, very good at their industrialization of their supply chain and have a lot of data. She might be able to say a little bit more about the actors and how she's, she's uh, confirming that we understand who are all the relevant uh, stakeholders at the building level. Then there's a question at the city level, but let's just start at the building level. So Fira, do you, do you wanna say anything? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Yes, so as Danny mentioned, we're looking at a specific company and understanding what are the different actors that are involved in the supply chain. Can you hear me? Sorry, my, my uh, earphone is not so great. It's a little bit bad, but it's it's okay. You can go for it. Yeah. So what, what we're doing is we're trying to follow from land acquisition until end of life, what are the different actors involved? And this is done through personal communications between the, between the different stakeholders in the supply chain. So I'm going one by one to the different stakeholders in the supply chain asking, what type of information do you create? What type of information do you need from different stakeholders for you to be able to create a more quality data? So this is done really in a bottom-up strategy, I would say, uh, at this point, and assessing how how do we define um, value for this kind of information, how valuable are this um, information. I don't know if I understood, like if I answered your question well, but <laughs> then this is, 
Thanks, Fira. Yeah, and I, I think that's that's really um, it's a it's a key question um, because there are so many different stakeholders, and the information comes online at so many different times in the life cycle. Um, and this kind of feeds, and I'll, I'll I'll pass it to Peter, but it kind of feeds into why the material information system is focused on on the bottom up with the materials approach. And, and I would say it's not just materials, it's products and, and all the way up to buildings. But then we, we can couple that with, uh, I would say kind of the stocks and flows as more of a top-down approach. And, um, but, but maybe Peter, I'll turn it over to you to answer the second more difficult question. Yeah, so um, it's a good point that you know, why why only materials? Well, it, you know, materials already a lot, but you're right that all the other things are also, um, very very crucial in this puzzle um historically as an answer of course uh when it comes to the construction sector and its environmental impact first you've had you had the large energy impact and so there was a lot of work on reducing that and there still is a lot of work on reducing that but so then relatively speaking the material uh environmental impact became a lot bigger once the energy impact started to reduce and so in that sense that's how material as a topic comes to the fore. And of course, it is, it is literally what the construction uh, sector moves about and does things with. So in that sense, it makes sense to focus on that. When it comes to other important things, such as land and even energy and other things, they're also, of course, embedded when we are doing life cycle assessments. Um, so the impact of materials on land, on energy, the energy to produce uh, materials, to recycle materials, et cetera, et cetera, is also in there. So in part, I think most of the topics uh, that you mentioned are covered, but of course, yeah, it, it could be wider, but I think in, in, in terms of scope, materials by itself is already quite wide. Um, so in that sense, it's, it's a kind of natural habitat, uh, let's say. Actually, the reason why I asked this question was um, I speak with a lot of actors in the field. And when I talk about circularity, uh, they just talk about materials, but it's not about that. I think as researchers in our language as well, we tend to talk about materials. It shouldn't be like that. At least, yeah, you're not really maybe analyzing water flows, but we should mention that water is important as well or energy is important as well. Uh, that was my point, and it's, uh, yeah, as you just said, with LCA or uh, other uh, tools, probably uh, you're considering other kind of uh, resources as well. Thanks for your answers. Welcome. I see another question in the chat, uh, which is more Singapore specific about the case study for Peter. Charmaine, if you would like to unmute yourself. Charmaine, I don't, uh, I can just articulate the she, question if you're not here. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. So uh, she wants to know what is, the, what is the focus of the Singapore case study? Is it existing housing or future housing? Um, because the current housing design of HTB in Singapore does not cover so much maybe about uh, circular economy, in particular about disassembly. And how would your research be applied with incorporation in cooperation with BCA development in the future? That's the Building Construction Authority, I think. Yeah, so um, in terms of uh, looking in existing stocks and existing buildings, um, that was the theme that we'll, we'll first focus on HDB typologies and modeling their uh, material content and, and what, what kind of material stock they represent because they represent such a big part of the big built environment. Um, that of course, that, that just as a, as a um, take out point takes the historic built environment. Uh, so it wasn't designed with circularity in mind, et cetera. But nevertheless, you know, it's still an important resource. Um, in terms of the circular economy potential model, there we look at new construction. Um, so it's 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 really as new as we can get it because we're exploring how big the bridge is towards uh, a paradigm where you can really in detail plan which materials you get back, what your recovery yields are. Um, so that is yeah, a new uh, unbuilt construction, let's say. 
Um, so it, in that sense, it's a, it's a methodological approach. There, there's no data validation component to it. I hope that answers your uh, question, Charmaine. I don't see any other uh, questions in the chat. If there are uh, no more Lisa, buttons, I had a, yeah. had, had a comment I wanted to respond to. It's not necessarily a question, but I think it's an interesting one. Um, I don't know if Lisa, if you want to say more about this. Uh, thanks, Peter. I think it, it is it's a um, perhaps an, an undesirable outcome of putting uh, this information about the material passports in a discoverable database, um, because similar to Stephen's point about previously, it was the gleaner and the rag and bone people that would look at when buildings are being demolished. What can they glean from it? However, by making this information available in a discoverable um, interface, um, just like information opens itself to cyber crimes, uh, this can open, potentially open up, it, it probably will, depending on context, it will open up to agents that, that then can be, can be um, exploring this from anywhere across the globe who can discover this information and identify local opportunities uh, where, uh, but, but you know, it all relates to how you're using this information. If you are selling now the right to reuse something that's in that building, that when it becomes normal end of life, and you will start seeing that uh, end of life events are coming through um, unnatural means earlier than predicted. And whether that's a type of an arson that might be difficult to discover or whatever, so it's, it's just the, the, the risk that making this opportunities available on a discoverable information um, interface potentially pose to the life expectancy of buildings. Um, and also the other, other point that I didn't actually put in the chat, whereas previously um, the opportunity to recognize uh, gleaning would be limited to, to rag and bone people that at a particular level in your society. It actually means that if we're doing this, this circularity intervention will effectively move opportunities away from the, the strata of the, the rag and bone people to, to people with access to information and the, uh, it will completely move it to another layer of, of society. Um, and that by itself, may have interesting uh, social justice implications. And maybe it's di different people will call it by different names, but it will have just like when you are improving inner city and you're making it more desirable, you're actually making it um, difficult for, for poor people who are um, less means to actually continue staying there. So these are just a couple of the few things that comes to mind that is potential implications of undesirable intentions, um, outcomes of what we're talking about. Tanvi, do we have time or should we close? Yeah, the... go ahead, we have time. Okay, I mean, I think it's a really important point. I'm glad you brought it up. And I think it really points to the need the, for research on topics three and four, because I think we are going towards more distributed information systems and we really need to think about these questions. Um, I have a couple quick thoughts here, but it's probably worthy of more discussion. I mean, the first is if, it, if the concern is that um, through legal means, someone would kind of make a call and say that my, I would like the rights to the assets inside the buildings, I think that can be solved with the conditional contract saying, you know, the building has to be uh, a triggered end of life by this, uh, by this person, and then you have the rights to this. Um, and really, as I see it, uh, uh, you know, what may happen is that if it's steel, for example, which typically appreciates in value you, and people invest in steel, um, you might uh, sell the right, future rights to the steel to uh, a, an investment holding company, but they don't actually want to recycle the building. They're going to hold it until they then the building is going to be demolished, then they will sell the rights to the to the scrap company, right? So um, I, I'm not too worried about the legal means. Um, the interesting question is around, um, you know, if you are then uh, uh, incentivizing people to destroy buildings earlier um, because they have now have, a, have access to this information. Um, this is a, a question about how do we design 
these distributed information management and distributed database or blockchain systems. Um, and just because uh, we make them immutable, there are options around if they're completely public or if we create some type of permission system um, or, or, or some way where we monitor the, the rights of, of access to the data. These are all very, very open questions, which we don't know the answers to, but we are going to research in this project. Um, and then I think third, and it's an important kind of question about the social justice and equity question. This is exactly why we need to think about the synthesis along with stakeholders and what are the implications. Um, and now we're doing this in two well-developed cities and, and we may not be thinking about the implications in, in other contexts. Um, so that might be a, a call for us to really incorporate that into the implications of such a distributed information management system. So uh, I think it's a really important point and thanks for bringing it up. I think Heidi has one more quick question, which is sort of related to what Charmaine was asking. Uh, Heidi, would you like to quickly articulate your question? Sure. Um, so I was just wondering in how much detail do you think you would be able to assess the reusability potential of the material stocks? So for example, if in Singapore, there's you, you create a model of how much concrete there is in an HDB building, would you just assign like a reusability score that's very generic? to the materials in that building? Or would you be able to do something very specific like link uh, or suggest that the materials from this specific building could be used in another development that is being planned? So I was just wondering like how much detail do you think you would be able to go into? I think that highly depends on the type of material and especially the amount of information you have. Um, the kind of... Um, Let's say the big puzzle to solve when it comes to reusing materials is and the circular economy is that there's a lot of legislation and norms related to building materials when they come fresh out of the factory. They're all tested, they have certain quality values, etc. When you take when you take a similar product out of a building, you have no idea what the quality is if you have no information. So in that sense, there's an enormous loss of value when you don't have information. And so in that sense, the modeling will strongly rely on the amount of information you have, because it could be a perfect, a perfectly good steel beam that you get out. If there's no kind of norm that you can put in it, how will some, you know, how will an insurance company insure you when you use that? Or what kind of values can an engineer calculate with when they're using that steel beam? Um, and so these are questions you want to solve and how, and that, you know, information tracking is one thing, but it could even be that, you know, there's pools of, of resources where, you know, there's an institution that actually tests certain batches or something like that. There's many ways in which this can be solved, but it's, I think that a lot of the yield potential is strongly related to the uh, information that you have available and even the way in which you model it is likely really uh, re likely determines how you can model it. Um, so in that sense, information is everything. Um, and I think I think that isn't isn't often stressed enough uh, in terms of any circular economy. And, and Peter remind, reminded me of one important point. And, and, and last week I was in I was in Sweden working with Thirhiwat and also Alex Holberg, who's who's here on the call. I see as well. Um, it, it responds earlier to the point about materials. Is that we think the material passport is not just about carrying the material information. One thing we're incorporating is at the end of the the manufacturing, and this was for volumetric prefabricated modules, there's an inspection that occurs. The time of the inspection, the name of the inspector, right now it's in a PDF form, right? But at least they have a digital copy. And this PDF at the minimum needs to be included as part of the material passport. So that we start to think about um, manufacturing information, which can be carried through and more and more as we start getting smart factories and IoT. And then we also wanna link warranty information. So what is the warranty information? So if a new user takes over the building, do they still have uh, uh, opportunities for, for warranty or, or things like this? So um, in this way, the material passport is, is, is also a carrier of all of that relevant information uh, as well. It's not exactly what your question was, but I wanted to point it out as Peter brought it up and it relates to an earlier question. And perhaps as a concluding remark, uh, just just to further highlight how much work there still is um, in terms of, uh, because of course there's lots of open questions, there's lots of opportunities, new systems, et cetera. When we're talking about this information and 
and how we store it. And Daniel talked about ontologies. Of course, knowing how to store the data and what data means and how to represent certain knowledge related to, build, to building uses to, to material uh, information. This all also needs to um, needs levels of unification or at least needs to be done in an interoperable way. Um, I see my uh, friend and colleague Waldo here and we've worked in the past on to make common languages for, for um, circular economy projects in terms of even just getting all the kind of domains or stakeholders around the table, everybody's using a different jargon, everybody's saying something else. So how, how do these things match? What does one thing mean in another context? But then also when you generate data, what does, what does the data mean in this, in this program versus that program? So these kinds of translation actions are also needed through this uh, to build this understanding. Um, and yeah, in that sense, it's it's a very uh, interesting uh, process. But yeah, we're we're definitely uh, at the start of an exploration still. Despite the popularity of circular economy as a topic, there's still a lot of hot issues that we can tackle. Yeah, and this is just the overture to the project. <laughs> and uh, I mean, there's so many interesting questions raised, and I'm. Uh, if you, uh, you can follow the progress on this work on our website and future events. And uh, I'm curious to see how this is going to shape up. Uh, I see, I, I think I'm going to try to conclude the session at this point, even though there are more, maybe more questions. Uh, you can always uh, get in touch with the researchers through the website. Uh, this uh, video would be uploaded soon on YouTube, so you can have a relook. And uh, you, the next overture is in two weeks from now for the dense and green module. So watch out for that uh, as well. And I'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thanks for having us. Thank you.